Hey, welcome back to this old tabletop. I have to turn a bunch of these parts. In fact, they are way more complicated than this, but um, this end looks like an automotive valve. It has a long slender diameter, a blend, face, and then a diameter here. That's all I'm going to show you. But there are some, this, this looks reasonable simple, but the diameter from here to here needs to be quite parallel. The radius blend needs to be at least perfect. Same for the radius blend into the face here. And to top it all off, it's um, 14401 stainless steel. Uh, that's uh, 316 stainless. It machines reasonably nice, it leaves a beautiful finish, but it's quite hard on tools. <laughs> I start with a one meter stick, 15 millimeter diameter, and I part it off into individual bits, which I can show you now. Parting off some 316 stainless 14401 for the ISO volt, running at 250 to 300 RPM, and I'm using the power cross feed at 30 micron per revolution using a 2 millimeter wide carbide parting insert. I will talk about the insert and the holder later. This is just for demonstration now. Uh, I don't use the power cross feed to cut all the way through. As the cutting speed gets lower, the surface speed gets lower and lower, the more we get to the center, the, the cutting conditions get worse and worse. And I prefer to cut the last bit by hand. And I don't even cut all the way through. I prefer to leave one millimeter of stock in diameter and just twist the remainder off. These are the this is, this is the parting tool I used to to part off the stock. Uh, these are sold by Garant. This is a rebatch. They are made by somebody else, um, and they use these two-sided two millimeter wide carbide inserts. They have two cutting edges. You can flip them around. You can, you can get normal parting inserts, like this one. This is just for going straight in. You can get uh, parting and turning. Th those are quite cool. You can go into the material, and then you can traverse sideways. For example, if you have to cut a white slot or do profiling on a CNC. And you can get full radius inserts that have, have the same radius as the width of the insert. Uh, so this is a two millimeter wide insert, so it has a one millimeter radius. These are nice for uh, turning and leaving a radius in a corner or for cutting reliefs, grind reliefs for example, because the full radius doesn't leave a stress riser. And yes, this is just a nice system. Basically every tool manufacturer sells something like this. Um, no matter if it's Iskar Sandvik or uh, somebody else. I decided on this system because I can get it readily and next door delivered, next day delivered to my door. And when we look closely at, at those inserts, they have a, a chip form and geometry in front here. I will zoom in in a second. And that's to deform the chip. And by doing that, this is a two millimeter wide, 1.99 or two millimeter wide parting blade. And the chip, this is a, a parting chip from, from earlier. And the chip is only 1.9 millimeter wide. Because the chip form a geometry bends and deforms the chip, it gets narrower. And that way the chip doesn't snag up in the, in the slot as easy and it just comes out. There is a close-up of the chip forming geometry here. 
it's this it's this divot here that goes up all the way to the cutting edge and when the chip flows in it gets bent in almost a u shape you can see it has this roof shape and this this is what ge gets formed by this this divot here and that's the magic behind those inserts and why they work then i used a braced carbide tool with a with a high positive geometry and a and a chip former to to rough it out like this and here in the shoulder in the corner of the shoulder i left quite a bit of material to form the radius and also this diameter here is still oversized by one millimeter this will be four millimeter on the end but now it's five millimeter and it has a tiny tiny center bore on the end so i can support it with a tailstock we're over at the lathe um, putting the part in the sixth jaw and i'm clamping it and the run out out here is now not defined I put in the, the center drill and turned the OD in the same setup, so if I indicate the OD, the center drill will match to it. Okay, I'm using a 2 micron indicator to indicate the, the outside end of the part. And it's, it's all over the place. So, this is an adjustable chuck. And... Let's see, we go to a low spot and we use our Elm key to move the chuck on the back plate accordingly. Notice I I used the I used the set screw, the wrench to, to move the set screw and the chuck into position and then I back it off like quarter of a turn and i do that so when i need to use the screw on the other side i'm not jamming up against this screw that's already way better than that's within 10 micron let's see if we can get a little bit closer Okay, that's well within 2 micron. When I bring the test stock in now, we shouldn't get any movement on the needle when, when, the, tails, when, the, when the life center goes into the center bore. Uh, we use some putty to clean out the center bore, just so there is nothing in it, and to clean the, the center itself. There is a little bit of discrepancy when you move the tailstock center up because the tailstock center itself had a, had a run out error, of course, that kicked our part off by two to three microns here, which is perfectly fine in this case. And we don't want to give excess pressure on the tailstock hand wheel. Otherwise, we buckle the part in the center. I'm using two tools. One is a, a braced carbide turning tool for the OD, the shoulder work. And we touch off on the end of the part with it. Zero out. And we do the same with our radius tool. I will talk about the radius tool later. We start by turning a, a shoulder back here that needs to be 14 millimeter plus minus. And I just relapped the tool, so I have to calibrate my diameter. According to the, I, I touched off on the OD of the stock and then I went into 14.8 millimeter. And now we check what we get in reality. Yeah, 
14.77. We put that into our DRO. Now we proceed to turn it down to 14.2, take a measurement and then take a final cut. Yeah, the chip, chip breaking with this tool is, is a mess, but I'm only removing very light, very, very, very small amounts of material, so I don't care too much. Okay. 14.201 so my calibration is good I can I can move into 14 millimeters take my final cut there we go now we cut our, our shoulder here to length this, this shoulder here has allowance here and here and one millimeter of allowance which in hindsight is a little bit much. And there we go. Now our shoulder length has only 0.2 millimeters of allowance left and we need that for to, to cut the radius perfectly. I could turn the OD of the shaft and the shoulder and the radius and everything with the radius tool, but the radius tool tends to have a little bit much cutting pressure and I'm worried that my diameter here could not be consistent. So I'm using this, this super sharp lap with one micron diamond on a, on a ceramic lap uh, braced tool which has very little cutting pressure. Oh, we're just working our way down to our final dimension. Okay, I cut down most material and I will, this, this is hot to the touch now. Uh, I will leave it, let it cool down and take a measurement and then take my final, final cuts. Okay, I have my 3mm radius tool in the tool post and it's already calibrated to, to its diameter and I touched off on the end of the part here. So 
when I move to my numbers, I will automatically get my the correct dimensions. As this is a form cutter and has a very large engagement, we will run this very slow. I put the, the machine in back gear, basically running at uh, between 55 and 100 RPM. I can vary that with the VFD. And now we will just slowly carve away the material. Stay away from the diameter and stay away from the shoulder. As you can see, I'm just moving in about one millimeter at a time and taking a plunge cut until I'm almost at the diameter of this shaft here. Uh, this takes some time. This, this is manual work. This is not CNC to axis interpolation. This takes its, its good old time, especially if you film it. Okay, we are really close for the blend, but as you can see, here is still a line. We could polish that probably with, with some emery cloth, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we're doing a proper blend here. It would be nice to know how much of a step we have here, so we can adjust nicely. A good way to check a blend like this is, of course, a dial test indicator. Uh, this happens to be a 2 micron indicator, so we should get a nice result. I zero it out on the, on the actual shaft, then I move over where the blend starts. So this is like 20, 28, 30 micron step. That's 60 micron in diameter. That's what we have to take off to get to a proper to a proper blend without a significant step in here. If we move further, we go of course into the radius. But right right behind the step, uh, the radius does not start yet, and we can take a good reading. So we have to take go in with the tool, thirty micron.
Okay, uh, camera crapped out, but I got my blend to my shaft diameter here very nicely. I will check it with an indicator in a second, but first we will cut the shoulder here to final length. And we use the carriage lock because the radius cutter puts quite a bit of, of axial force onto, onto the carriage. It wants to move it away. Okay, uh, I hit it with a with a Kratex stick, and I'm checking again for the for the blend line. I have my two micron indicator here, reasonably good mounted, and now when we look for the blend line, yeah, there it is. That's somewhere in the one to two micron range of a step. There starts the radius. So that's pretty decent. Uh, that's good enough. Okay, and here it again it is in focus. You can see the nice, nice radius here. No sharp corners, no edges, no nothing. Just the a really good blended radius. <laughs> it, it, that's all. So now let's take a look at the tool I used to cut the radius. Okay, here's the radius tool I was using. This is a steel shank, this is some low carbon steel, and I silver soldered a piece of six millimeter round carbide into a pocket. It's, an, it's at five degree angle in both directions. To form the clearance angle and I will show you a picture how I made this. Here is a, a grinding wise setup at 5 degree in my big milling wise and the part itself is also tipped over 5 degrees in the other direction. And then I used a 6 millimeter carbide end mill to plunge the pocket for the carbide insert. The carbide insert is just the shank of a 6 millimeter carbide end mill cut off with a diamond wheel and I used the diamond file to to scuff up all the to scuff up the surface where it silver solders. And I used some some black flux and some 30% silver silver solder and silver soldered the, the carbide into the steel shank and then I surface ground the top with a diamond wheel and held it up against my, my slow speed carbide grinder for a final lap of the, of, the, of the surface here. As the diameter of the end mill, the end mill shanks are very precisely cylindrical ground. They need to be uh, very precise because with modern shrink fit shrink fit holders the shank diameter and tolerance is very critical so that's a very good source to get very precise carbide round stock if you don't want to buy actual carbide stock and the roundness and surface finish helps us in making the radius cutter because we don't have to grind the radius ourselves and the quality of this radius is hard to achieve with any grinding tools that i have in my own shop so that's good and the only thing I have to grind is the top. And this gives us a very good radius cutter. I use this technique a lot. I made a lot of cutters this way and they always work very well. <laughs> they leave a very nice finish because due to the good quality grind on the OD, the cutting edge quality also gets very good if you, if you take care and grind and lap the top surface well. Okay, this is the turning tool that you saw earlier, which I used to turn the shank of these flux capacitor valves. And as you can see, there's a piece of braced carbide and some ugly grinding and some lapping in front here and even finer lapping here. 
uh, here is the silver solder joint and here is the multi-fix holder and when we zoom in now uh, this is like I think this is about 10x magnification and we go up to 40 now wait a second until I get my brightness right and here's a close-up so ugh. this is the corner that does all the cutting this this is the corner and those two edges with the radius connected these are the cutting edges and you can see that there is some kind of a of, of damage ugh, right here and that's abrasive wear on the on the top surface of the tool. Uh, this is not a built-up edge. This is this is a hole in the carbide. The 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 combination of heat and the chip moving by. The, this is exactly the point where the chip rolls off and moves away from the cutting edge. Some minor damage on the cutting edge here and here. Uh, this is the area that does most of the cutting work. This removes most of the material. I used this tool with about 0 0.2, 0 0.1 millimeter depth of cut, and this is about uh, a 50 micron corner radius here. So it matches up quite nicely. But the area that does all the finish of the surface, it's this here, this is the transition from the radius to the back clearance here, that's still in in okay shape. Uh, I can't get this in, in very good focus through the camera. This is quite ugly. And over here uh, we have a different type of, of, a, of, a, of a problem. Here, this is actually a built-up edge. Uh, this is where material... Yeah, here you can see. I just snap the piece of, of this built-up edge off. Uh, I crushed the tool early into the material and some of the material welded onto this edge here. So that, that's a different kind of, of cutting edge damage. Uh, a built-up edge is not exactly a damage yet. In fact, in some in some cutting conditions, a built-up edge is even desired because it can protect your actual cutting edge. It's almost like um, a blade of armor for your cutting edge. Um, this this abrasive wear on the top of the of the cutter, this is where the, where the chip rolls off, is also not directly a problem. Once this damage gets so large that it, it intersects with the cutting edges, then it's a problem. And I will take this tool to the, to the diamond lab and I will lap this top surface down until this is gone. But just to give you an idea, um, a, a microscope is just a super useful tool. And with naked eye, you almost do not see this, uh, this damage. It's, it's almost invisible. I can show you in a second through the camera. So you can hardly tell that there is this tiny, tiny abraded area here on, on this cutting edge. Yeah, the, the top grinder looks but ugly, but you can see here by the reflection uh, that it's lapped. <laughs> also here on the on the side, it's ground with a D125 diamond wheel, and then up here, only this area here is lapped on the diamond lap because this down here is just clearance and doesn't need to be lapped. It's it's way faster if you do it just in the areas you need. So that's some cutting edge damage.
Okay, you just saw me facing this flux capacitor valve to length and the work holding was a bit tricky to figure out. As you can see, it has a very long shank but a, only a very short large diameter and then if I was going to hold on to this on this diameter here of a collet, um, the rigidity out here would be rather bad. So I decided to hold it on this large diameter. But when you hold something with that little engagement and I call it um, the alignment like this, this is uh, very tough to do. So I decided to make a guide bushing. There it is. Uh, this is a piece of this is a piece of stainless drilled and bored to match the diameter of these wells very precisely. Then I slid it four times with a slitting saw and took a grooving tool and almost cut all the way through so it, it's, it's springy, can compress. Uh, all this diameter back here is relieved, only this diameter in front here, you can see the step I guess, match, matches the diameter of of the valve here. So basically this, this, this part here sits in the collet then you slide in the part into the support sleeve and when the collet grabs now it will compress this guide sleeve, clamp on the shank and the collet will also clamp on this large diameter and this allows for very good alignment onto the rotational axis but also a very rigid setup because it's supported uh, out, out away from, from the part. I could also have bored a, take me an emergency collet or a four millimeter collet, in fact, that matches this diameter and bore it in front uh, to hold this large diameter and this smaller diameter. But I figured why waste an emergency collet if, if this method here will work just as fine. Mm -hmm. 